Well, now I have a better understanding of where the two come from and how you work that. Um, do you, at any point, or have you ever found one more satisfying than the other? Everybody asks that, and it's terribly frustrating. It's like, which arm do you saw off? Uh -huh. Which half of your heart do you cut out? Well, maybe everybody asks you. But... It's two different kinds of thinking, and they work in synergy, but they're not the same. Uh -huh. And when people try to... I can, I can illustrate this very simply. When I first got a computer to write with, it was sitting on my desk. It was a very early old Apple. I bought it secondhand, and, you know, it was like funny little dot screens, and, you know, it wasn't much. But it saved me that enormous effort of retyping the book after I created it. Great, I'll take it. I was sitting at the drawing table, and I had a whole lot of art jobs, because art at that time was pulling in some of the income to write on, because I was doing my first novel. Second novel, actually. At the time the first novel was done on a $25 junker I bought, <laughs> a little typewriter at a, at a second hand. But anyway, so I'm sitting here at the drawing table and I'm painting. And a friend of mine is trying out the word processor. And I turn around and I see they, they reach the end of the sentence. And I'm painting away and I said, make a spot. Not use the period, make a spot. Mm -hmm. Another time I was sitting there and somebody went, to answer the phone and take a message, and they wanted something to write. They said, don't you have any writing paper? All I see is drawing paper, mm -hmm. expensive work, all paper, this, that. And I said, there's stripe paper in the drawer. So that's visual thinking. You don't think in terms of symbolic content where you do writing. Writing paper is symbolic content. That is a word that is a symbol for a sheet of paper suitable for writing, but right. it doesn't describe it visually at all. Visual thinking is visual. So I used to laugh when I'm heavily, heavily into painting. I can't balance my checkbook and I'll look at the shine on a car and practically get hit. Because I'm thinking visually, oh, look at that cool pattern. Right. I'm not thinking cognitively in the same way. When I'm writing, it's a whole different set of skills. Yeah. And then my drawing gets really clumsy. Got it. So switching back and forth is easy if I'm not under deadline pressure. Then I can do it kind of organically. Mm. But when I know I should be writing in the other room and I need to be painting, you get this, I should be doing this, and that's the biggest worst static in the world. You can't really? accomplish anything when shit is in the way. You've got to kick that word out of the English language. To be creative, you can't create and destroy at the same time. When you're being creative, everything goes. There are no limits, there are no boundaries, there's no criticism, there's no, you're creating. Right. After you know what you've got, and that may be a little while down the road of playing no limits, that's when you destroy and the editor says, this is when I want to pull out of this mishmash. Mm -hmm. Then you start destroying what doesn't fit. So should is a, is a destroyer word. Should? Should is a destroyer word. Isn't it? Think about it. You're not boundaryless. You're not absolutely fine where you are. It's a very negative word. Can be. Yeah. So that one got to go. So I have trouble switching back and forth when the pressure's on. Uh -huh. Because that old should, you know, the contract or the book or the the current project needs to get done before you can completely play. So it has its place, but not when you're going for the no boundaries. Creativity means no boundaries. Let what's going to come come. Um, you seem very independent, and I recognize you know your drive for individuality. But in, in both of your um, dimensions, your dimension in you know, art and painting and your dimension in writing, who have you drawn upon? I know you never want to copy somebody's work. I mean, you can draw inspiration from somebody, from friends, from other painters and such. Start with painting. Who, who have you drawn inspiration from? Who, is, who has been, beside, beyond Don, who have you drawn inspiration from? Thousands and thousands and thousands of Pick two. Give, give me two. I will do the best I can. Okay. I read every book in the library when I was growing up. I almost became a non-reader because what they handed me to read in school was so boring. <laughs> I said the woods is much more fun. And I practically became a non-reader. So Walter Farley's Black Stallion books got me. I was really? in second grade. They were in the teen section of the library. The school refused to let me take them out. I had to go to the library after school to get them. I discovered the first one in my brother's room. Uh -huh. But yeah, it's like, wow, now I get to read about horses. This is cool. And it's about 
boys that go to desert islands and get shipwrecked and wow whole other world this right. is the world i'm living in the woods this is the world that i'm building for right. this is the world that i'm fooling around with under the hedge this has the magic and so i learned to read because finally i got handed content that had meaning to my and where i was sitting there going see spot run i wanted to just totally rebel this yeah. is meaningless and it was it was if, it, if i had the education system i'd teach kids to read with comic books whatever they want yeah. Give them excitement, give them adventure, give them what is going to stir their soul, then they'll read. Now worry about the content when they're old enough to choose, but when you're trying to get them to learn the words. You go into the first step first. First step first. So, okay, I have to credit Walter Farley because I wouldn't have been a reader. I probably would have been a wilderness guide or goodness knows what <laughs> without that. Uh -huh. um, then there was Howard Pyle. I went to the Brandywine Museum and saw his incredible paintings. And here's a man who wrote and drew. And I did both. I loved to do both. But that still wasn't a real career for me. I went to college thinking science. Until I realized that, you know what, if I do this, I can do that, that, that. I can do science, I can do this, I can do whatever. So I can duck in and out. So. Why did I choose to fit it together? Because it was infinitely moldable. My mind works visually. It works in words and symbols. It works also in sound. And I would like to bring that entire synergy onto the page, onto the canvas, into my life, into my relationships. I don't think it's a case of you focus on one point. Focus on many points and bring them to bear on one point. Now you have a multi-dimensional point. Right. So yeah, in a book or a, in, a, in a book and picture where I'm bringing it together, I want to give you the experience. Visually, emotionally, mentally, I want to bring you places you haven't gone. Okay. In a grounded way or an ungrounded way. It may be as crazy as some way disconnect idea, or it may be as simple as, I want you to feel like what it's like to be in an offshore trip in a tiny boat in the middle of the ocean, which I've done. Give you that sense of experience, mm -hmm. because I can't give you my life, but I can give you pieces of it to strike a spark in yours. And out of that, you might see what you need. So the inspirers who have helped me, mm -hmm. so next would be Howard Pyle. If you're talking strictly writing and illustration-wise, um, Arthur Rackham's work blew me away. I tried to do pen and ink, but it didn't work. You know, So I tried many, many, many different mediums. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, any painting that I walked around the corner and said, wow, any morning I got up and looked at the sky and said, geez, look at that cloud, or look mm -hmm. at that, look at the way the sun is hitting that grass, or look at the, the sky after that hurricane. How can I point to one piece of inspiration? It's right. everywhere. 